it's actually quite weird uh, to see myself um, following straight after the titans of aerial archaeology, um, talking about 40 years of, uh, of ARC. Uh, but it is actually this year that uh, we also uh, celebrate 25 years since uh, we started uh, working in Romania. Um, it certainly, aerial archaeology didn't necessarily start with us in, uh, in Romania. But uh, what you will be seeing today will be certainly uh, our take on it. And it will be more uh, with reference to our own work. So um, the year of grace was 1998, um, but as I said, um, things had happened before. Now, the way things happened before was very much at uh, the level of illustrating pretty much uh, new sites and uh, not necessarily uh, looking for new ones. Um, to some extent, um, uh, Alexandra uh, Simeon Stefan had done that, um, but um, it wasn't in a structured program that was targeted to, um, to, to discovery uh, and using this as a tool of prospection. Uh, Jana Bogdan Katanichu, who some uh, of the older members uh, still remember as um, uh, taking part in uh, some of our earlier meetings in the early 2000s, um, has uh, also used uh, aerial photographs at, um, at the time, uh, in the 70s, especially the 80s, um, for uh, her work on Roman frontiers. Uh, you may recognize uh, across, the, uh, across my presentation a very strong Roman uh, archaeology bias, and there's nothing to do about that because both <laughs> myself and uh, Bill, uh, who is um, uh, my partner for 25 years uh, in work, um, we've, you know, we are more interested in Roman archaeology, so uh, that will be a thing. I don't think that happened necessarily in Romania, however, uh, quite a number of countries have gone through that uh, Roman-oriented uh, development of uh, remote sensing uh, techniques, uh, so there you go. Um, but um, this had happened before um, I actually met Bill in 1997. Uh, at that time, uh, Bill had um, done already a number of years of uh, aerial reconnaissance in Scotland and targeting particularly um, crop mark uh, sites, mapping them, producing distributions, uh, and so on. Uh, but in 1997, he actually came as, you know, in his quality of uh, Roman archaeologist, uh, specialist, uh, to the, um, to the Limas Congress, the Roman Frontier Studies, uh, that happened that year in uh, Zalo. Uh, I was uh, at the time just out of my undergraduate studies and um, looking for something interesting uh, to, uh, to join. And uh, Bill had noticed uh, some aerial photographs, some very old ones, uh, in uh, exhibitions, and decided that perhaps it was um, an in it would it could have been an interesting thing to uh, actually use aerial uh, reconnaissance as a method of prospection, uh, and uh, see if that's applicable in Romania. Now. Um, just to make a quick um, uh, a quick uh, break, the uh, a quick diver uh, diversion. Uh, at the time, uh, Romania had just um, uh, just woken, yeah, from uh, got out of his uh, of its own uh, communist uh, era. Now um, that era is known for many many things, but uh, very few uh, appreciate just how hard it was actually to do anything uh, like our colleagues were doing in, in Britain or in other countries in, uh, in Europe at the time. Um, technically, uh, everything from uh, maps yeah, to taking photographs was strictly forbidden because it was a state secret. It was the Cold War and we very much felt it. Um, very much uh, because of that, uh, it wasn't um, it wasn't even possible to produce very accurate site plans or uh, distribution maps 
of uh, archaeological sites and so on. So uh, this was very much something that um, had lingered on into the arch into the way that archaeology was being performed at the time until, you know, in the mid 2000s, I would probably say. But, you know, we had to deal with it. So that was the, the background uh, through which we uh, started doing aerial reconnaissance. Um, at the time, uh, Bill was lucky enough, having been rejected initially by British Academy, to land uh, a small uh, grant from uh, Liverpool Trust, who allowed him to uh, come to Romania for the first time in 1998 and start flying. Now, um, Fast forward a few years, uh, this is what happened afterwards. Uh, so from the initial area of reconnaissance, uh, trying to not to switch this off. Um, so fr from the initial reconnaissance uh, in, the, uh, in Western Transylvania between 1998 and 2000, then we've, we've moved based in 2005, six uh, in Southern Dobroja. Uh, which we've covered um, at that time uh, through my uh, postdoctoral um, postdoctoral fellowship program and afterwards through the archaeological landscapes uh, project. Um, we've also participated and collaborated with Romanian colleagues uh, from the National uh, History Museum of Romania uh, and covered the north of Dobroja as well as uh, through the middle there um, the uh, the old uh, valley, the Transalutanus Limes uh, and uh, the the southeastern corner of uh, Transylvania. Uh, now, obviously, these, uh, these different areas have been uh, surveyed at different intensities, and the track logs that you see there on the map um, do tell that story. Um, of course, uh, it's, um, uh, it's one thing when you just fly one season, and completely other when you're flying um, over and over the same landscape over um, a number of years. So. Um, the rate of discovery of uh, sites and improving uh, information about the existing ones uh, obviously varies greatly among them. But um, the, the methodology also has developed uh, greatly uh, in all that time. And uh, when we started with uh, aerial reconnaissance, just um, applying that, uh, mapping what we find, uh, producing distribution maps and site plans, um, has developed in the, uh, in the following years uh, into um, much more landscape, block landscape uh, coverages, which were uh, at the time uh, possible uh, from the, uh, in the second part of the 2000 and onwards, um, through access, through free access to Google Earth imagery, but also to, um, through free access to um, early satellite imagery and, there, uh, and afterwards um, uh, World War II uh, vertical aerial photographs. So we just dumped, dumped it all together and tried to make sense of, uh, of everything that we mapped. Um, if Kathy was mentioning that you know she uh, she was part of a uh, team that had six people in, uh, there was uh, just Bill and I, yeah, in ours. So that's of often what happens in uh, in academic contexts where you know you're just dependent on whatever money you can lay your hands on, and uh, try to make best sense out of it. Uh, it hasn't happened in 20, uh, it hasn't changed in 25 years at all. I'm afraid. Um, obviously, with reconnaissance, uh, things um, are uh, developing also depending on weather patterns around here, and I'm sure uh, this was uh, this is known uh, by uh, people um, gathered here today, especially when you're looking for crop marks. So um, the first couple of years of reconnaissance weren't that great, were particularly wet uh, in the area that uh, in the in the western Transylvania. So that's why our rate of success uh, was um, more oriented uh, in those two years uh, to upland sites uh, like uh, this, um, uh, this hill fort uh, at uh, Uroi, um, a very well known actually landmark, um, uh, natural landmark uh, on, in the middle of the Muresh, of the Muresh Valley, but um, which hadn't been um, a, a properly appreciated, properly surveyed. Essentially, people not looking for 
uh, at the hill from the other side <laughs> of the hill uh, uh, than the one uh, with the quarry facing towards them. So that's where you can see um, at the back of the hill, you can see a, a running um, um, rampart, um, which, uh, which is very much extant and uh, which uh, indicates uh, the area of the uh, hill fort. Now, um, of course, things changed uh, afterwards uh, since 2000, uh, when it was absolutely brilliant for crop marks. It was so, uh, so dry that uh, even uh, you could uh, gather uh, things showing into grass uh, coverage, not just uh, the, the typical um, uh, wheat, barley, and so on that Cathy was mentioning earlier as being the preferred um, uh, land coverages that would show anything archaeological. So uh, that was very much the case at uh, Chigmo, uh, and but uh, in um, uh, in other places, of course, we we had patchy coverage uh, where um, where um, ag ag agriculture was also happening. Um, obviously, some sh uh, some uh, areas were showing brilliant uh, records of uh, of uh, crop mark development, while others were totally blank. Of course, yeah, uh, the uh, the very green ones are uh, covered by corn. Um, another thing that we've noticed was that uh, whenever land was cultivated, uh, was the predominance of uh, late crop marks that um, that were showing really well uh, archaeological uh, underground. Uh, the um, and that was uh, something that we didn't necessarily count to the uh, recorded to the same extent in that area. But nevertheless, if you're looking at our photographs now, 25 years after, yeah, this is why you'll see a lot of late photographs. Also, because that happened uh, to be the time of the year when probably Bill was managing to get out of work, uh, out of the teaching job, um, and, uh, and uh, get to Romania uh, for aerial reconnaissance. Um, that, so we've obviously covered a number of, uh, of sites, a lot of uh, Roman military sites and their civilian settlements. Um, we've also, um, this one is uh, among the largest of them that we managed to patch together. And uh, these have been uh, subsequently used uh, to a certain extent by the teams that working, uh, were working on the ground at the time, well, doing excavation. Um, in uh, either at that time or subsequently. Um, that was also looking at um, uh, not just um, uh, military sites, but also urban sites. Uh, you can see here a, um, a small uh, part of the, a uh, very important urban, uh, urban settlement uh, of Dacia, um, which uh, is at Apulum, which shown very well again uh, in crop marks. Um, and from these, as I said, we managed to do um, to do distribution maps as well as uh, as um, uh, site plans. Uh, some of them you've seen earlier. But um, the one of the biggest challenge at the time uh, was very much um, managing to identify what's new from what was known. Um, people in the audience might still uh, remember how it was back in those days and um, with, uh, with archaeological gazetteers. Uh, we certainly did not have anything uh, uh, online uh, and open access. Um, you had to compare and contrast and you had to, uh, to chase, um, uh, to chase uh, toponyms that were just simply not existent on the maps that you could lay your hands on. Uh, and and so on. So it has been a nightmare. It had it's a lot easier these days, but you know there's still a lot of work uh, to do. Still, we did manage to uh, to find some interesting information, um, such as uh, on um, or rural sites which had been a lot less um, targeted by uh, by archaeologists in Romania uh, since probably the uh, the late 50s, uh, when because of the collectivization and the interest into the you know bringing the rural up and whatnot, um, had uh, had been um, uh, focused on the the history of uh, uh, capitalist imperialist development uh, back in the Roman period um, on uh, villas. But we did manage to find interesting, th uh, interesting things. So, uh, one of the largest, probably the largest villa that we know now in Dacia uh, here at uh, Warga, uh, previously unknown. Uh, and also another one um, at uh, Vinsu de Jos, uh, 
And uh, the reason why I included Vinsu is not because of its size, um, also being known only from um, up until then, um, uh, what we discovered it, nobody knew about it. Uh, the site was known about prehistoric activity. Some of it you, uh, you can see there by uh, those, uh, uh, should I say maculae? Uh, but I won't. <laughs> they, are, uh, they are just uh, pits uh, and, uh, and sunken floor houses uh, settlement that you can see in the top picture. Um, and uh, it turned out not to be just pre uh, prehistoric, but some of them were actually Roman. And that was because uh, either uh, each of these sites have been uh, subsequently excavated to a certain extent, uh, and uh, that's when uh, things were validated and um, uh, proposed dates of, of occupation happened and so on. So um, both of them were part of um, student training excavations, both of them in collaboration with Western universities. Um, and um, yeah, we are looking forward to see uh, the um, uh, how much more of the size that we've discovered at the time uh, we'll see the, uh, the same treatment. Um, then we moved on uh, into, uh, into the southeast of Romania, which uh, presented different challenges. Um, if the uh, if the um, loss um, geology was uh, was helping us a lot in terms of crop marks uh, this uh, discovery, uh, there the trick was uh, one uh, to um, to have a site that you can actually map because the size of, size of the field was you know was making it impossible in many cases to actually add detail um, uh, from aerial photographs onto them. Um, so it was a bit of a nice nightmare. Um, but another one, especially in the, uh, in the subsequent uh, seasons uh, during Arkland project, was uh, to, uh, to actually be there in time and record before, uh, before everything was being harvested and uh, plowed. So the sites were actually being, you know, exposed unnecessarily to further erosion um, because of this early plowing by uh, commercial uh, big companies uh, that were involved in, uh, in um, agriculture there. Um, we also managed, as I said, to, uh, to include a lot of uh, historical imagery uh, there, both um, from, uh, from uh, corona satellites of the 60s, but also, uh, as, I urged, uh, as I mentioned, the Second World War um, aerial reconnaissance, but for very different reasons. Uh, indeed, uh, in the second case, uh, the challenge was uh, to make sure that you select a, a sortie uh, that, uh, is, uh, that is um, scouting for later bombing um, uh, missions in the area, so that you can obviously uh, have as little disturbance <laughs> into the landscape as possible. Um, it was a very interesting time, very um, in at moments very emotional um, to see you know things uh, that are being destroyed you know just in the next sortie. Um, but you know the good thing about it was that uh, we actually did manage to put into the archaeological landscape a lot of information that had subsequently disappeared by development by. Uh, collective communist type um, um, uh, land reclamations and and so on so that was the uh, the benefit of the uh, the major benefit of the exercise so we managed to reassess and uh, put back into uh, on the table uh, interpretations on uh, very large monuments uh, such as uh, Valului Traian, which um, if people are familiar with uh, Hadrian Wall and Antonine Wall, uh, you can probably easily uh, see uh, resemblances there. And uh, as I said, uh, because of these very large um, uh, freight uh, Co of coverage uh, across the landscape, uh, really come as close as we could uh, to um, re to producing a very large coherent archaeological landscape rather than just individual site plans. Uh, this is how it looks like now after uh, after many years, after twenty years. Um, so, um, but it's still um, it's still showing more and more stuff. That's part, probably also part of the reason why I didn't manage to publish that yet. So. Um, 
but certainly some of the things uh, that absolutely stood out from the beginning uh, were um, burial mounds. Um, and Dobroja, this part of uh, Romania, has lots of it. Um, those that are involved nowadays in the um, in the um, uh, interworking group uh, with Ukraine, uh, you would, they would uh, recognize the, a lot of the uh, of the patterns there. But certainly, it wasn't necessarily a similar um, cultural background, cultural and historical background. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, was immediately apparent, and uh, something that I tried to uh, to explain later on, was how you can use burial mounds to actually uh, get uh, reconstruct settlement patterns, which was what I was interested in, rather than just you know all the mounds in the area. And uh, certainly for this um, was um, uh, was very useful uh, to first to map all the evidence, although not all of it. Yeah, you can uh, here you can see the kind of uh, information that you get uh, into areas that haven't been you know completely covered by uh, modern development, like at Kalatis there, and how you know how much more. There is actually around the landscape. I think actually uh, Madi Stefan has also filled in a lot more of this area. Yeah, so um, there is more uh, there to uh, to be counted in. Uh, the but not everything was mounds. Um, there were mounds at Tuzla. A lot of them were happening uh, were just visible as this you know light colored. Um, uh, patches of ground uh, scattered on mostly uh, um, plowed fi uh, fields, so soil marks. But uh, some of them, and especially this, uh, this group, uh, which was visible uh, in the uh, Corona sat uh, satellite image here, uh, was not. It was actually uh, that was, uh, you can see that already the, the patches are looking a bit you know, fuzzy and definitely not as round as and big as um, as the others look like. So in that case, that is how a uh, ancient town in ruins that was uh, recorded by von Winke in uh, 1830s looked like in 1966. So uh, that is um, that is a cautionary tale that uh, we. Uh, had to apply uh, when interpreting uh, just uh, soil mark evidence uh, time and time again. But um, a lot of the people uh, before uh, we start, uh, we did our work there um, started to, uh, they weren't convinced why we were mapping barrows and advocating for, um, for settlements. And that's because the traditional uh, interpretation was uh, was that um, the barrows uh, were all prehistoric and uh, mostly connected with uh, Scythians who were very mobile and therefore they, you know, they just plumped yeah, around barrows wherever they happened to go. And that was certainly not what, we, what was visible from the air, uh, especially uh, with uh, larger distributions, with large, larger aggregations of, uh, of the monuments and so on. Uh, and that was very much the basis of the, the article I published in Antiquity in 2013. Oh God, 10 years ago. Um, so maybe I do deserve this place in the history of aerial archaeology session then. Right. But um, then uh, af afterwards, um, it also transpired that um, traces of settlement were indeed recorded either by satellites or uh, by our own photographs in uh, proximity to, uh, to barrows. Uh, this is uh, mapped from, uh, fr uh, from uh, satellite imagery. Uh, from uh, GOI satellite imagery um, with traces of, Rome, uh, of settlement right in uh, right where the Romanian online gazetteer put in together by uh, INP, the former CIMEC, uh, says it should be. So that's a very convenient uh, um, uh, time label for me to use. Uh, but also, um, there's further settlements like the one with a question mark that we just don't know because that's not recorded anywhere. Um, the probably probably the other, the one in the middle, badly affected settlement uh, is probably a little bit further on, but there you go. So that's one uh, example of association between barrows and settlements. Um, 
There's another one. Uh, this one is a Roman villa. It's recorded by the uh, National Gazetteer, but that's the number there. Um, but you know, you can see on this uh, on this plan, uh, it's um, evident proximity to uh, to barrows. So um, the mapping exercise of barrows had um, um, had allowed me then to create different um, um, to different categories of aggregations that uh, I then used to uh, to advocate for the presence of um, of um, um, extensive um, aggregated settlement in the middle of uh, Dobroja. Now, uh, this was again uh, something that went against grain, um, against uh, previous knowledge, and that was very much uh, dependent on um, the uh, modern mapping of uh, rivers and stream availability in the area, i.e. fresh water uh, availability, which, I mean, to a certain extent is uh, true, but then very much, as we all know, it depends what, you know, sort of map resolution were you using when you actually started mapping those. So uh, that's when things become a little bit more blurred. And certainly in this central east-west be belt, is a, uh, an area that has a lot more availability of water, and that's reflected by the, the presence of traces of settlement uh, in, the, uh, in the vicinity. Um, that was very much, uh, as I said, uh, based on these objective interpretations uh, of uh, geographical, uh, geographical features in the area. This is an actual um, uh, model um, of, uh, of hydrology um, that was made uh, in GIS uh, and actually shows the, um, the streaming potential uh, that is happening across the landscape. And this is actually fitting much better uh, with uh, our distribution of settlement across uh, the entire landscape. Uh, also, um, here I, point, I should point out uh, the, um, the uh, potential flooding uh, model that we've run there to identify areas that are floodable. Uh, a lot of change, as I said, happened because, uh, especially along the, uh, the Danube River, uh, because um, uh, of the conversion to arable uh, protection from floods, which I think the theory now is changing and the area is now being restored um, as a means of protection against flooding, and um, and uh, but certainly it did matter for the interpretation of distribution of archaeological features. Um, we also managed to to run more models. This one is uh, uh, using uh, least cost path analysis, very basic to understand a bit more uh, on the road network uh, that that was happening and keeping alive. I suppose. Um, uh, military bases, Roman military bases along the Danube. Um, okay, uh, this one is just a very quick uh, one uh, illustrating uh, the landscape uh, around Galatz in north, um, in the northern part of Dobroja. Well, actually, this, this one is just outside the um, uh, Dobroja. Uh, into the southern Moldova, but uh, pe perhaps uh, the most exciting uh, new development was the use of uh, LIDAR. Uh, now, this hap uh, happened for various reasons on a very good quality data set um, that uh, we managed uh, to convince BBC to collect. Um, and uh, it you know, completely transformed our knowledge uh, around the, uh, the most iconic site of Romania. Um, that's how it looked like through various visualization. I'm not going to get into details because people know what I'm talking about and they recognize uh, these type of visualizations uh, with uh, new um, understanding of um, military uh, stra strategy uh, in on and around the site, but also a new understanding of the distribution of Iron Age, late Iron Age settlement, and how it communicated, how it aggregated together. Um, and I suppose this is now leading to the future uh, in, with the availability of open access LiDAR data. It's definitely not the same quality, but hey, it's there, it's free, so we've got to use it. So um, just uh, on, this, uh, on this slide, it helped us locate uh, a number of, uh, of villas around uh, Sarmizegetusa Ulpia this time that were mentioned in the literature but never found after. And 
um, and is also uh, raising new understandings of, say, how um, how the uh, boats are, um, the Zeikan Corridor, the Iron Gates of Transylvania would have functioned from early prehistory all the way into the, into the modern age. So, photos are available in online archive, um, instructions how to use uh, archives uh, have been published, so there you go.